It's bad for you, except when it's good for you. That's the sum total of what many people know about cholesterol. And it's just one such dietary consideration that people are told to watch out for, even as they're not exactly sure what it is. To help us get past the confusing facts about cholesterol, we welcome Dr. John Stevenpiper. He is Associate Professor, Nutritional Sciences and Nutritional Medical Education Coordinator, Faculty Medicine, University of Toronto, and it's good to have you in that chair. Thank you. Thanks Thank you for coming much. in tonight. Thanks for having me on. We just heard in the previous segment from a registered dietitian and from a medical doctor who talked about the difficulty and complication of trying to get good, reliable, solid nutrition science information. Does that ring true to you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I'm someone who was also involved with uh, clinical practice guidelines for the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and Canadian Diabetes Association, and we have a hierarchy of evidence that we use when we're assessing the evidence. And the highest quality evidence uh, comes from randomized controlled trials, and in particular those on patient important and public health important outcomes like heart attacks, strokes, and death. And what we find in nutrition is we don't have a lot of those trials. We do have some, for example, for the Mediterranean diet, but really there's a paucity of those. We tend to have randomized trials on surrogate biomarkers, such as cholesterol or blood pressure or things like that. And we have observational studies that can look at some of those outcomes, but where we cannot infer causation. Hmm. You do clinical trials all the time, I guess, right, in your line of work? That's correct. Okay. And how are they funded? So what we do is we go to get government funding first. So usually from the Canadian Institute of Health Research or um, other health agencies like Diabetes Canada or the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Uh, however, increasingly that funding is under a lot of pressure and we're finding that there's not enough. So what we find is that we need to supplement that funding as that funding gets clawed back uh, with industry funding, in particular with industry groups that align with us and are, we believe are with it, uh, really interested in the public good uh, where we can actually as opposed to them influence us, us influence them to innovate and produce healthier products. Well, that is the key question, right? right. I mean, people wonder about the optics of, I mean, there's no such thing as no strings attached money, I presume, whether it's from government, they have their pressures, or whether it's from industry, they have their pressures. Agreed. How do you negotiate your way around all of that? So, I mean, I think the starting point is the government uh, funding, and we have to advocate for more government funding. Uh, that, I think, is the most independent form of, of uh, research funding. But where I think we can interact with industry and with the agricultural and agri-food uh, sector uh, is really around unrestricted funding to do research that gives uh, researchers the freedom to publish and to report unfettered. You have that? Yes, absolutely. There That's are no absolutely strings required. attached to any money you get from industry to do clinical trials? The funding that we get, we do not get contract money. We only get unrestricted funding for our trials so that we have that freedom, yes. So when people read the results of your work, they should not be under any illusions at all that industry has influenced the outcome of your findings? We believe that, but I mean, there is research that shows that industry funding may influence uh, findings, and it may be unconscious, but we certainly put uh, transparency in place, and we put these safeguards like unrestricted funding in place to ensure that we can do the research that we set out and want to do um, without any interference in terms of asking the question, in terms of the conduct of the research, the analysis, interpretation, or decision to publish. Do you ever find them trying to influence your work? No, on the contrary, I find that industry actually gets it. I mean, there's such pressure right now. They tend to want to be arm's length. They don't want to uh, interfere, certainly in the area of research where we're doing a lot of our work. That's the case. I see that. I mean, the, the federal government has certainly amped up spending over the last couple of years, almost a couple of years that they've been in power, and, you know, $30 billion plus deficits. So uh, one would think there would be more money available to do what you do, and particularly, the, as you describe it, it, it is the most independent source of money. Why isn't there? I, I think there's a lot of political pressures uh, on those dollars, so although spending may have increased, we're finding it's not in the area of health research. In fact, we're finding that now, given the number of researchers and, and grants that are out there, that the funding rate is less than 10%. So less than 10% of grants are getting funded, which means a lot of researchers, the really important questions, are not getting their grants funded. And increasingly, they're having to look to other sources. On top of that, where it is getting funded, that research, those research dollars tend to get clawed back. So what we ask for, we don't get uh, the total amounts. So then we have to go and look for other sources to make up that uh, shortfall. Gotcha. Okay, John, let me just take a second here to point out that after this program airs tonight, TVO is going to air a documentary that is critical of both the food and medical science behind the cholesterol issue. And that's one of the reasons we wanted you here, because with that background having been put in place, we want to get a better understanding of cholesterol, because I think we hear a lot of conflicting information about it. Let's see what we can nail down here. Starting with the basics, what is it? 
Well, cholesterol is actually synthesized by the body. Uh, synthesized meaning? Meaning it's made by the body. It's, it's essential. It's used in the digestion of food. It's used, it's in all the membranes of all of the cells in the body. And it's used to make very important hormones, steroid hormones in the body. For example, sex hormones like um, testosterone and estrogen, as well as hormones that control stress response, the glucocorticoids, or even electrolyte and fluid balance. So it's, uh, and for that matter, vitamin D, which we make from uh, sunlight, the precursor for that. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, if you like, a molecule that is essential uh, to life, absolutely. And, you know, this is a layman's look at it, obviously, but I've always been told there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Are there more than two different kinds of cholesterol? Absolutely. So, uh, like anything, I mean, just because it's essential and is used in cells doesn't mean that too much is a good thing. And we can see that with glucose. For too much glucose, you can get diabetes. Or too little, you get hypoglycemia. Too much blood pressure, you get hypertension. It's the same thing here. It's, everything has to be in a fine balance. And we find is when we have too much of the bad cholesterol, which is the low-density lipoprotein cholesterol called LDL cholesterol, that we find that this is atherogenic and is causal. It is what? Atherogenic. It causes atherosclerosis or the hardening of the arteries, the plaques uh, deposits, the fatty deposits in the arteries that lead to heart attacks and strokes and death from those. Okay, I suggested good cholesterol versus bad cholesterol. Um, you know, is, is it actually fair to label LDL, bad cholesterol, and the other, what's the other one called? Uh, HDL cholesterol. HDL, and, and is it fair to call that the good cholesterol? I think in very simple terms it is, because the HDL cholesterol tends to be like a mop that goes to the system and takes up uh, the excess cholesterol. Um, so it actually helps uh, the system regulate. Uh, the LDL cholesterol, on the contrary, when it's too, mu uh, too much, is the one that ends up into the ar walls of arteries and can lead to this process called atherosclerosis. Now, one of the nice things about working here is I've already seen the documentary that airs immediately after this program. So one of the things they say in that documentary is that, as you have described it, the cholesterol that is created naturally or synthesized naturally by the body itself in the view of the people quoted in the documentary, 70% of that is good for you. Do you sign on to that? Well, I think it would depend on your level. Uh, so if you're producing too much and you're not regulating it, then I would say that uh, that percentage might be less. But in, I think, healthy individuals, um, from my understanding, that might be reasonable. And how do you yeah. regulate it? So it's regulated by uh, the cells, the express receptors that actually take it up to take it out of the bloodstream where it can cause problems with the blood vessels. So one way to do that, I mean, genetics predisposition is an important one. So we have to know that there are people that are pre uh, genetically predisposed to have very high LDL or bad cholesterol. And these people are at high risk of having heart attacks very early in life, in their 20s and 30s and, and 40s. Um, and you see this in whole families. So in these people, uh, very high, uh, they have very high cholesterol, and, and it's certainly problematic. Um, but in mo most of the population uh, where, with average cholesterol levels, and even in those with the very high cholesterol, we can regulate that either with medications or the first, the cornerstone of all uh, of everything we do is diet and lifestyle. Mm. Now, again, I'm going to overly simplify this right. thing, and then you help us right. with a, a better understanding. It seems logical to me that the more cholesterol you ingest into your body, the higher your levels will necessarily go up. Does that, in fact, follow? So this is an important distinction you're making. So there was the cholesterol that's endogenous we make in the body that we talked about, but there's also the cholesterol that comes from the diet, which is exogenous. So that cholesterol can, in fact, influence your cholesterol levels. There's some question whether that relates to cardiovascular events, like heart attacks and strokes and death from those. But if you consume too much dietary cholesterol, in particular in people that are predisposed to having high cholesterol, it can increase cholesterol. But the main driver of cholesterol appears to be saturated fat in the diet. Okay, and what is the correlation between high cholesterol levels and heart disease? So high cholesterol is causal uh, in terms of heart disease as it relates to heart disease that's caused by atherosclerosis, this process of uh, depositing of, of cholesterol in the vessels. So it, it gets too high, it gets into the vessels, and one gets either occlusion of the vessels or develop, you can develop something called thrombi or emboli. This is where parts of the vessel wall will be thrown off and actually occlude and cause a clot, hmm. which will block a vessel and lead to ischemia of the heart. So let's nail this down, because in the documentary that we're going to show right after this program, there is a you know, great debate over the last five decades as to whether or not the cholesterol you ingest, what's the word you use? It starts with an O? Oh, exogenous. Exogenously, I think I okay. <laughs> exogenously, definitely leads to heart disease. In your view, does it? Uh, I would say that I think it's less clear about the, what the cholesterol we consume, but the cholesterol that's in our system that's as a result of what we consume and what we make very much is causal uh, in heart disease. It is causal. So yes. you will draw a straight line yes. between too much yes. cholesterol 
Yes. And heart disease. And the reason I can be so confident in that is we have very large randomized controlled trials. In fact, we have 27 trials in over 174,000 individuals that have been randomized to statins, for example, versus control or lower doses of statins. And we find when we though, in either primary prevention or secondary prevention of heart disease that we see reductions in events that correlates perfectly with the reductions that we see in LDL cholesterol. And we also have a number of other drugs that have been developed to target LDL cholesterol through different mechanisms, which also show a cardiovascular benefit, which is to show they show less heart attacks, less strokes, and less death. Okay. Heart attacks Let me follow up on statins, because again, the documentary afterwards, th th there are those in the documentary, experts as yourself, who will say, statins don't do a damn thing to reduce your cholesterol level, and frankly, it's a waste of money. What's your view? Well, my view is I think that's a cherry-picked view of the science. I think you can pick individual statin trials that maybe didn't show benefit in certain groups, for example, people that are on hemodialysis or others. But when you look at the totality of the evidence, so when we do guidelines for the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, for example, we don't look at individual trials. We look at the totality of the available trials. Trials, again, randomized controlled trials representing the highest level of evidence we use to inform the clinical practice guidelines. Okay. When we look at the totality of that evidence, what we see when we pool all of those and aggregate those, what we find is you do see reductions in heart attacks and strokes and death from heart attacks and strokes, very patient important outcomes. There's no question about that relationship. That's high quality evidence. So that's a key finding, right? Because there's obviously, you know, billions upon billions of dollars in the pharmaceutical industry dependent on the fact that you believe these things actually work. Yes, absolutely. And they do work. And they do work. And, and I would say, too, I mean, where the, some of the controversy was, was is it the cholesterol lowering or are there other effects of statin drugs? Mm -hmm. Um, but since we've had newer drugs that have come out that target cholesterol in different ways, the bad cholesterol, also showing this benefit, and particularly we have new drugs that have come out probably after this documentary called the PCSK9 inhibitors that work specifically on cholesterol lowering without any other effects, showing the same benefits and showing for the same cholesterol lowering, the same reduction in cardiovascular events, we've become quite confident in this LDL cholesterol hypothesis or cholesterol hypothesis of heart disease. And to be clear again, mostly for me, because mm -hmm. I'm trying to learn as we go mm -hmm. along here, if you take a statin, it lowers just your LDL, just the bad cholesterol as opposed to the good cholesterol? In fact, it will lower the bad cholesterol and give you a slight increase in the good cholesterol. But the predominant effect is to lower the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol. Understood. Okay, a couple more questions before we're done here. Can the science behind the approval of pharmaceuticals be manipulated in the same way that nutrition science over the years has from time to time been manipulated as well? I mean, I think that's always a question, is the role of industry. And just to put the things into perspective, to do a large randomized controlled trial on heart attack strokes and uh, death as an outcome requires thousands of patients over many years. So now we, the, the largest trials are around 20,000 patients plus over multiple years. These cost between 300 and $500 million each to do. Each trial? Each trial, like mm -hmm. half a billion dollars now for the most recent trial, the Fourier trial with this new drug, PCSK9 inhibitors. So just to get, it's an incredible expenditure. So a lot of that is borne by the, the pharmaceutical industry. Some of it is covered by government, but this is a tremendous uh, cost. And at the moment, a lot of that is, uh, is sponsored uh, by uh, the drug industry. But things have been put in place to ensure that uh, safeguards, if you like, and transparency guards to ensure that uh, there's the minimum amount of influence. So all trials have to be registered now. The protocol has to be registered in terms of what one's going to do. So one can see that one does it uh, as one set out to do and didn't change things midway through or go on a fishing trip. Um, one has to get their work peer reviewed and, and reputable journals. So that peer review process all adds another step. Um, and then there's transparency in terms of the funding source and the uh, investigators and how they've been funded so that one has all of those things in place. But I think the most important thing is it's based on a randomized controlled trial, which gives us the best protection against bias, uh, really a design that no one can question. So when we're looking at these designs on an outcome like death, I think it's very, very hard to, uh, in terms of wiggle room. In the past, it might have been that some trials weren't reported, but now with these trial reporting requirements in place, I think that's not going to be the case anymore, that you cannot conduct a trial without first pre-registering it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Since I asked you this question about the food business, mm -hmm. I'll ask you the same question mm -hmm. about the statin business. Mm -hmm. I guess, what, Crestor is one of the most, most famous statins out there? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, and All right. Obvious question. This, do the folks who make Crestor support your research? No, we don't have any pharmaceutical uh, research uh, dollars uh, funding any of our research. I don't receive any money. I've received no honoraria from any pharmaceutical industry. Good to get that on the record. Yeah. Dr. John Stephen Piper from St. Michael's and the Faculty of Medicine at the U of T. Good to have you on TVO tonight. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. 
Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.